Commercial photographer and one of my greatest inspirations in photography, Chase Jarvis once said, the best camera is the one you have with you. For myself and most of us around the world, that is our phone. It's super portable, it's super easy to use, and with every year, the image quality is getting better and better. In this three-part tutorial video series, I'm gonna teach you guys how to use your phone to get the coolest cycling photos you possibly can. In part one, I'm gonna discuss all of the features in your camera and how these can be used to get great cycling images. In part two, I'm gonna discuss some of the concepts that I've learned over the past 15 years as a professional photographer in order to make your cycling images as creative and unique as possible. And in part three, I'm gonna go out for a ride with a cyclist and do a real world photo shoot with my phone along the way to give you guys some insights as to how I shoot while I'm out riding. A quick disclaimer on this video, I am discussing a lot of it to do with the Apple iPhone. However, all of the photography techniques I discuss and a lot of the features in the camera are gonna be applicable to all different brands of device. So even if you're using another brand, do stick around because there's lots you can learn. So with all that being said, I'm super excited to start this video series. Let's get into it. This is how to shoot the best possible cycling photos with your phone. So let's get into it. This is part one, as I've said. In this tutorial, we're gonna discuss all of the camera features that are in your phone, and also talk about some of the things that I have set up in my phone to make shooting images more easy. If you jump on my Instagram, you'll see that all of my stories and all of my story highlights are shot with an iPhone, and everything on my Strava is also shot with an iPhone. Yes, I do shoot with a mirrorless camera, the one that I'm shooting this video with now. All of my commercial work is shot with a Canon R5. However, I'm using my iPhone iPhone 99% of the time. A lot of people message me and they ask, what camera do you recommend to shoot cycling photos with? My response is always the iPhone. If you learn the concepts with your phone, you're gonna be able to use these down the track once you've got a better camera. However, to start out with understanding light and composition and framing and exposure are the things that are gonna make your images better rather than just a piece of equipment. One of the other reasons that I love shooting with my phone is the speed of shooting with my phone. It's really easy to grab out open the camera and be shooting within a matter of seconds. Whereas it's a little more difficult when you've got a camera strapped around your shoulder and the thing weighs a bit more and requires adjustments of settings. The iPhone is super adaptable. You can change lenses in a moment and you can be shooting photos really, really quickly in order not to miss any of the things that you see coming. You'll see more on this in the third episode coming soon. Okay, so let's jump into using your phone and some of the basic settings that are available on your phone. For me, I'm using an iPhone 13 Pro, but I have also used an iPhone 11 Pro in the past. Because this video series is to do with using Apple devices, I'm gonna discuss cameras in the iPhone 10, 11, 12, 13, and the most recent 14. These cameras are all really, really similar across them. The image quality has improved, but the settings within the camera are very similar. And so no matter which device you own, there are things that you you can learn here. Okay, so first things first, how I access my camera in a pinch when I'm on the bike. Now there are three different ways to open your camera. The first is that you can click and hold down the little camera icon there and with that tap the camera opens. The second option is by opening your phone and accessing the camera app. I have the camera app placed quite close to my thumb so if I do have my phone open, I can access it really, really fast. The third way and the way that I access my camera the quickest while I'm out riding is actually the swipe method. If you open your phone and you swipe across, the camera opens automatically. This is really nice when you've just grabbed your phone out of your pocket and you wanna access it really, really fast. You just swipe across, the camera opens, and you're ready to go. Once you've opened your camera, there's a number of different things on the screen that you can see that in order to get better cycling images, you either need to have turned on or off. Up the top, we have the flash on and off. We have the raw on and off. There's filters and there's live photo. Flash, we all know. If you turn the flash on, it gives a little burst of light every time you take a photo. The reason that flash is not a good idea for cycling photography is that in the iPhone, it will slow down the operation of the camera, meaning that your images are going to be blurred. At night, if you're 
shooting something close like a person, that's totally fine. But when you're shooting a bike coming past at high speed, using the flash is gonna mean that the image comes out blurry. I always keep the flash turned off. The raw button, now I believe this is only available on iPhones 12, 13 and 14, or it may just be the 13 and the 14. The raw button does this. When you turn it on, you're shooting a much higher quality image with a lot more visual information in the photo. However, this requires putting the image from your phone onto the camera and using a photography program to manipulate the image in order to bring out that detail. If you are only shooting photos on your phone and leaving them on your phone, have the RAW off. It's gonna save you a whole bunch of space. If you are planning on printing some of your images, definitely turn the RAW on, but don't leave it on for everything because you'll burn through a whole bunch of memory. The next little button is the filters button. Now, if you press this, you'll see along the bottom comes up a whole bunch of different filters. These filters automatically and in real time process your image with a certain look. So that might be slightly warmer, it might be a slightly cooler tone, it might be more color saturation. These are different things that you can set and leave in your phone in order to have your photos look a certain way when you shoot them. For me, I always have the dramatic filter turned on and this is one of the reasons that the photos in my Instagram stories look the way that they do when I post them. I don't put any other processing on my images other than that dramatic filter. One of the nice things with the Apple filters is that you can turn them on and off after you've taken the photo. So if you shoot a photo with a specific filter on and then you don't like the look of it, you can go in and edit the image afterwards in order to make the photo back to its original image. The final button across the top is Live Photo. Now again, like Flash, Live Photo is something that I avoid. What Live Photo does is it takes a very small snippet of video, say a two or a three second video, and then it takes an individual slice out of that video to give you your still image. This is cool because you can go in afterwards and select a specific image from that live photo, a different frame within the video in order to get the shot that you want. However, the reason that I have it turned off and the reason I don't like it for cycling photography is that it slows down the operation of the camera. Because it's taking a small two to three second video, every time you shoot an image, the camera lags and needs to refresh before you can take the next one. So for me, I have the live button turned off. Now, the next thing I wanna discuss is the exposure control. If you swipe up from the bottom and you tap on the exposure control, you can see that you can drag it up or down in order to increase or decrease the exposure of the image. The iPhone and all devices these days are really good at analyzing the light in a situation and adjusting that in order to get the correct exposure for your image. The reason this isn't good is because if you're in a especially dark scenario, the camera is gonna lighten up the image a lot and the photo is gonna come out unrealistic. Or if you're in a really bright scenario or you're looking at something very, very light, the camera is automatically going to bring down the exposure. And what that means is that details in the photo are lost in the shadows. The reason exposure control is really good is because you can manually override that exposure in order to get a photo that is more similar to the real image that you're seeing with your eyes. For example, if you're in a dark forest and you're looking at some trees, the camera is automatically going to bring up the exposure because it thinks what you're looking at is too dark. The problem with this is you lose contrast and color and the scene that's actually recorded in your phone is much brighter than what you're seeing in real life. By being able to adjust the exposure, you can get the scene to look more how you want it to look, and it means that your photos come out looking more realistic and more interesting. The exposure can be accessed in two ways. One is this way that I've just showed you along the bottom bar by swiping up and tapping on the little plus minus. The other way you can control the exposure and the way that I do while I'm out shooting is by tapping on the screen and then dragging up and down, and you can see the little sun emblem goes up and down, and the exposure of the image also goes up and down as well. One of the important things to know with the exposure control is that after you've adjusted your exposure, the camera actually goes back to its automatic setting after a couple of seconds. Now the way you can counter this, and one of the things that I use a lot of the time when I'm using my iPhone, is the autofocus auto exposure lock setting. The way you do this is you tap on the screen and then you hold down. You'll see the little box flashes a couple of times and what that means is the exposure and the autofocus are locked in that one spot that you set it. The reason this is important is because you can then move the phone around with that exposure set and get the framing and the composition of the image that you want without the exposure changing. 
in order to get out of that auto exposure, auto lock setting, you just tap on the screen again and the phone will go back to reading the scene and giving you an average exposure for that scene. As you can see with these photos that I took of my bike the other day, by tapping on different areas of the screen, you can get the correct exposure for either the sky in the background or the frame in the foreground. By dragging down the exposure, I was able to get a silhouette. By bringing up the exposure, I was able to get the detail in the drivetrain and the bike itself and the background that was less important was faded out. So yeah, the exposure control is something that I use a whole heap of. Have a play around with the exposure while you're out shooting. See what you can come up with and you'll soon find that your images look more and more impressive. A couple of other little settings you can see there in that bottom bar are the self timer, which I rarely use on the bike. However, you can use it if you wanna set your phone up and take a photo of yourself. There's the three and the 10 second self timer. You've got the button to switch the camera around to be selfie mode. And then you've obviously also got the photo taking button, which is that big one there right next to your thumb. A quick note on using that big button there, you can either use that big button to take photos or one thing that a lot of people don't know is that you can actually use the volume up and volume down down buttons to also take photos. This is really useful when you're out on the bike because you can hold the phone like this and with your thumb you can shoot photos while you've got a good grip of the phone. Okay, so now you've got a solid grasp of how to use the exposure controller and the other settings within your phone. Let's discuss the lenses that you've got on your phone. Now, depending on what phone you have, you're either gonna have two or three lenses on the back there. These lenses are the 0.5, which is the super wide angle, the one times, which is your regular lens, and the two or the three times, which is actually your zoom lens. If you've got an iPhone 14 Pro, you'll find you have the 0.5, the one times, the two times, and the three times there. However, in the other phones, you've only got three options. Let's discuss what those lenses do. The 0.5 is your super wide angle. The super wide angle, as the name suggests, is a wide angle lens that you can fit lots in. Now this is what I use most often when I'm out shooting on the bike. The reason I like using the 0.5 super wide angle lens is it gives that real first person look. You can hold the camera really close to your subject and because it stretches out the edges of the frame, you can fit lots into the image. This is what I use to get those handlebar photos where the ground is blurred underneath. I use it for switchback images. I use it for selfies. It's really good for group selfies where you want to fit a lot of people in but you're only at arm's length. You can get really interesting compositions with the super wide angle. However, if you use it in the incorrect way, you're going to find your images look a bit bland and weird because the center of the frame feels so far away. The second camera is the one times lens. Now this is the standard lens. It's equivalent to about a 35 or a 30 millimeter in a regular camera. And this is kind of your standard lens just for shooting all sorts of things like landscapes, people, groups of people. You can shoot bike photos with it. It's just a regular all round use lens. It's nice for taking photos, but it doesn't give you the extreme look of either the super wide angle lens or your zoom lens. I avoid using the one times a lot of the time because I find it just a bit too boring. The third lens is your zoom. Now this is either the two times or the three times depending on the phone that you have. A zoom lens is obviously great for shooting subjects that are really far away, but where it's more interesting is for showing off a subject in the foreground and the size of something in the background. If you stand back when you're shooting with the zoom lens and you zoom in, the background is gonna get compressed. It's going to come closer towards the subject that you're shooting and look larger as a result. As you can see from this example, when I zoom in, the mountains look absolutely massive, whereas if I zoom out, the mountains look small in comparison to my subject in the foreground. The other way, I. I like to use the zoom lens is on long and winding roads where if I was standing too far away and shooting with the regular lens, the road is just going to look like it goes off into the distance and you can't see any of the detail in it. By zooming in, it compresses the road, it brings it closer together and those S's become nice and visible all the way through the frame. Once you add a subject into the frame, it becomes a much, much more interesting photo. Like the super wide angle lens, the zoom lens is great to get interesting compositions and it's also a way to frame elements out of your photo that might be distracting. Okay, so now we've discussed all the elements within your phone, as well as all the different lenses within your phone. I'm just gonna quickly run through the different settings that I have set up in my phone so that you can see the way that I shoot. For me, when I open my camera, I have the filter turned on always, I have the flash off, and I have a grid on. The reason I have the grid on always is because it gives me those horizontal horizons and vertical verticals, especially when I'm shooting outdoors or I'm shooting buildings or things like that. A really nice way to keep your images clean and professional 
you're looking is to keep the horizons level and the verticals vertical within the frame, unless you're using that super wide angle lens where you're looking up and you get that really cool distorted perspective look. For all images, however, I really believe it's important to have a horizontal horizon and therefore I use that grid at all times. The way you turn that grid on is you go into your phone settings, you scroll down to camera and then down to composition. As you can see there, you've got the grid on and off and you've also got the view outside the frame on and off. I like to use the view outside the frame to be able to see what's going on outside the edges of my frame so that I can add in any extra elements that might be outside my frame that could make the photo more interesting. A couple of the other settings that I have set up are the prioritize faster shooting because we are shooting action and you want your camera to respond rapidly. Lens correction I have turned on, although I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference. That's for those wide angle shots. I have the macro control turned on because when I'm in my camera, I like to be able to choose whether I want a photo to be macro or not. However, this doesn't apply to cycling because I'm never shooting that close to a subject. And then the last thing I do is have some of my settings preserved. The reason I have some settings preserved is so that when I open my camera, the same settings are applied as when I last locked my phone. Your phone does go back to its default if you don't have preserved settings turned on. So I'm just gonna explain how to turn those on and what I have turned on. And so your camera is set up in the way you like it every single time you open it. When I'm in the camera settings there, press preserve settings, and then you'll see I've just got a couple of the tabs turned on. The first one I have is creative controls. That means that the filter is always on every time I open my phone, rather than having to manually apply the filter every time I open my camera. And then the other tab that I have turned on is the live photo tab. As I said before, I don't like the live photo setting being turned on when I'm in the camera. So by turning this live photo setting on in preserve settings, it chooses my last setting that I had the live photo set at, which is off. And that means that the live photo is always off every time I open the camera. It sounds a bit confusing to have the live photo turned on in here and off in the camera, but basically the live photo in preserve settings keeps the same setting that you had when you were last in your camera. That means for me, when I've got the live photo turned off in the camera, it stays turned off every time I open it. And then as you can see, all the rest of the tabs I have turned off. I don't need to have any of those turned on. I'm happy with the way the camera is set up there. I've got my grid, I've got my filter on, and I can go in and use the different lenses and use the exposure adjustment to get the images that I'm after. Alrighty, so that is it. We are at the end of part one. As I said before, in part two, I'm gonna talk about all the things that I've learned over my years of shooting and how I apply these to using my phone to shoot cycling. I'm gonna discuss things like framing a composition, using light in an interesting way, and how I create action in my images by choosing the right lens for the right scenario. I hope you've enjoyed this part one and I hope you've learned something. If you've got any questions, please make sure to ask in the comments down below and definitely do subscribe so that you can see parts two and part three coming soon. Thanks for watching my how-to. I'll see you guys all very soon. All right, and there you all.